good morning everyone and uh, thanks for joining in today so uh, so i just i'd like to take just briefly one or two minutes of your time just briefly to uh, speak about our center and why we are having uh, these webinars so once i just share my screen Okay. Yeah. Um, so I am Surad. I am a senior research associate with uh, the Center for Predictive Human Model Systems at Atal Incubation Center (CCMB). And uh, this center was uh, established uh, now almost three years back. Uh, to enable... uh, can I just request everyone to uh, mute themselves for a while uh, during the session? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so this center was primarily established uh, to enable uh, the model systems that are based more on human biology. And as you might all know that biology has primarily relied on animal models uh, to understand uh, various human diseases. But in the past um, few decades, there have been several advancements uh, which have led to the creation of several new model systems which can um, generate more human relevant data. So these include, for example, but these are not limited to, uh, but include organoids, organ on chip, 3D engineered tissues, uh, and advanced imaging techniques that now help us to understand human biology in a more direct way, rather than kind of interpreting it from using animal data. And um, as I, what our center does is, uh, uh, to understand how we can further enable and advance these methodologies in India. And we primarily do this via a few, a few ways. So first is um, increasing awareness. So one of the most important aspects has been the awareness about these new methodologies is currently low in India. So we do this via writing popular science articles, reviews, or conducting uh, this web, uh, webinar such as these to create awareness for these methodologies. Uh, then we also conduct uh, several education and training workshops, and we, have, uh, we uh, also have recently uh, got a grant to conduct an EMBO India lecture series in um, in this area, and we'll be coming out with the details regarding it soon. And uh, we are also involved in several policy initiatives in order to um, uh, to understand how we can uh, change, bring about a change in terms of uh, policy for uh, enabling these technologies in India. So for this, uh, we have written several white papers and conducted uh, multi-stakeholder roundtable meetings between the government uh, regulatory bodies, public and private stakeholders to provide recommendations to, uh, to combat the challenges which are currently there uh, in this area. And we're also involved in several global collaborations uh, again, to increase the understanding and promote these methods. And uh, fourth is funding. We have recently uh, given a grant to two Indian scientists to develop an adverse outcome pathway in the field of cancer. And uh, the way we uh, would, the, the way we envision the roadmap towards uh, further advancing human relevant research in India is what we would uh, ideally like is uh, having a centers of excellence to further develop and validate these methods. Mm -hmm. So such centers of excellence have are now established globally. There is a center in US, there's a center in Europe and several other countries. So having a dedicated center uh, to further develop and validate these methods uh, would be would play a critical role. Uh, second is to getting these technology uh, to the end users. We need more connections between the technology developers and the end users, so that is what we would like to enable. And uh, uh, finally, after developing a technology, it also needs regulatory approval. So we also engage with the regulatory bodies during the technology development process to uh, ease the process of regulatory approvals. And uh, another thing which we also uh, are trying is how we can enable further cross-border collaborations because some of these technologies are uh, in advanced stages of development in many countries. So how can we enable more cross-border collaboration for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for exchange of knowledge and, uh, of, and for increasing funding? And another issue which you have also realized is we need to uh, further enable the supply chain for indigenously developing this, these technologies because many of the elements of supply chain are also currently uh, lacking in India. So how we can further do that? So that's also something we are currently in, um, involved with. So uh, apart from this, we also have a quarterly newsletter and we have uh, the second issue of the newsletter will be coming out um, 
uh, by end of this month and uh, we'll be posting the registration link of the newsletter in the chat box please register so this newsletter would have articles videos uh, and opeds and uh, various grants and job opportunities in this area so if you would like to uh, know about this and several other general uh, the advancements in the area both in india and globally please uh, register for this newsletter and with this i would like to thank you for your time and i'll just stop yeah and i would like to introduce our today's speaker uh, dr uh, abhijit majumdar he is an associate professor in um, in iit bombay and uh, he did his phd in iit kanpur and post doctoral fellowship in instem ncbs harvard medical school um, boston from 2012 to 2013 and his lab is currently looking at uh, several things and i'll just mention few of the things include the role of chemical and mechanical signals during cell de uh, cell development and cell fate and he is also been looking at his also his lab has also been developing say um, this microfluidic platforms and currently he'll talk about uh, what are the engineering principles which one needs to keep in mind while developing uh, organ on a chip so with this i would also like to thank him for agreeing to speak in our webinar series and i would like to yeah, over to you dr Uh, thank you, Surat, and uh, thank you, Sham, for this invitation. And it is really, you know, fantastic effort that that you are taking here. And as you said, the awareness is low, although it is it is now now coming up. And and I am sure that your initiative is actually, you know, playing a very positive role in in building that uh, awareness. So I will share my screen. And... so also just briefly if there are any questions please type in the chat box and uh, we'll just take them in the end so yeah so please feel free to type any questions you may have in the chat box so is my screen visible <clears throat> uh, yes yeah okay so yeah thank you everyone and uh, good morning and you know welcome to this talk so uh, the first of all the talk title that that i gave was as engineers guide but then uh, later on i realized what i'm going to talk about is not actually the guide but i'm just talking about the perspective you know i would like to provide some kind of engineering perspective in this field of organ on chip and uh, i will probably raise a few questions and then i will ask you to think i will probably tell you that you know where to find those answers but i i mean i will not be able to provide the answer because i don't know the answer or the field does not know the answer yet so uh, so essentially when we talk about the i mean you, you know engineers we think about big plant and and you know all those things but then lot of the engineers all over the world they are now you know uh, getting part into designing microfluidic devices and organ on chip which is utilized for various different biological applications <clears throat> so for this audience i don't need to talk about what is organ on chip and why that is needed but still to you know ensure that everyone is on the same page for first few slides i will discuss about that so if you already know all those you know details please bear with me so so like the what is an an, an organ on chip so it is a platform which is used for pre clinical and some basic biology research and there are some few characteristics that it should or it must have so may i request everyone to mute their you know uh, otherwise yeah thank you so the first characteristic is that it it should capture at least one structural aspect of the targeted organ so if if i plan to you know mimic say kidney on chip i should at least i need to mimic at least one structural aspect of that it also should capture some functional aspect at least one functional aspect the major function of that particular organ that i want to mimic it should capture at least one function of that major of in one major function of that organ it generally uses human cells and probably more than one in 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 most of the you know designs we use more than one cell types although not uh, 
may i request everyone again please mute themselves thank you um so yeah so it uses uh, more than one cell types relevant that particular organ specific cell types it is generally 3d or pseudo 3d so it is a a, a progress or deviation from our two dimensional you know monolayer culture that we do in the lab and then generally it 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 has a microfluidic flow so like the, there is a continuous perfusion so that the nutrients are continuously supplied and uh, whatever is kind of you know excreted that is taken away so this is the major structure but then as i said this is this this is generally 3d generally microfluidic flow but it must have one, at least one structural aspect and one functional aspect to call it organon chip okay so why do we use organon chip again uh, it is it is majorly kind of thought that it will be useful for the pharma industry and for the uh, various kind of testing and screening also that the toxicological testing and screening so if i think from the pharma industry to develop one particular drug starting from its initial lab testing and the molecules it takes long time like the, you know on an average 10 years so it is thought that it our this organon chip models can save time it will it will also save cost a huge cost that goes into animal testing etc that will come down it will and why it will be time saving and the cost saving because the in our present system that we use that is our either our 2d monolayer culture system that we do or in the animal model mouse model which is genetically very different from human so that kind of takes a lot of time and which which we can probably save which we can probably save if we can uh, uh, use a model which can mimic human response better uh, surat i think uh, from your side you can mute everyone and then yeah, yeah. i can unmute myself yeah yeah i'll do that yeah thank you so <clears throat> yeah so the it will imp uh, so yeah sorry i just lost my track sorry about that so uh, in the 2d culture model or in the mouse we often we don't understand the working mechanism that well because of these differences and <clears throat> now my slide got stuck okay then the prediction failure in the patient sub group which may work in a particular group may not work in a different group different gender different age etc and so clearly it tells us that the what we are using right now that is you know the 2d monolayer culture or the mouse model they are not the optimum models so we start with almost 10000 molecules here out of that only few finally go into the mouse model and 9 out of 10 that worked in the mouse model finally fails in the human model so clearly the mouse model and even if i don't consider all the ethical issues even in terms of the scientific point of view this is not a very efficient model these models are not very efficient model another thing that actually kind of you know worry people a lot that is when i say that 9 out of 10 molecules that worked in mice fail in human that is one kind of which increases time and cost but you think all think also in the other way that you started screening thousand of molecules here but then you discarded some molecules here because they did not work but they actually might be useful in the human because of you know this because this system cannot capture the human response well so it might be happening that we are discarding some molecules which might be useful in in actually human model but there is no way to test that i cannot start with human trial to start with so these are the background and reason to develop some kind of uh, in vitro model where we can capture human response to drugs and, and other 
uh, materials and the molecules. <clears throat> so other than that, there are, we, if we want to use, if we think of that, I want to make some personalized medicine, then how beautiful it would be that if I have something, you take the sample from my body culture, and then you let me know which medicine works the best for me. Uh, again, for, so for that, you don't want to trial that on me, but if, if there is a small device where you can test and predict, that would be the best thing to do. For the cosmetic industry, for the long-term effect of the chemicals, yes, that is another important parameter and there also this can be useful. And finally, last but not the least is the ethical issues that can we reduce the animal use? That is another bigger goal to our this, uh, this organ on chip or this alternative to animal models that we talk about. So our question is that can I mimic the response of a human body to a drug or chemical in vitro? That is my question here. With that question, if you proceed, I will just first give you one example. This is a very common example. And for this audience, I will not run the video, but you can, if, if, if you have not seen the video, I request that please run the video. It's a beautiful, you know, the uh, system. So what they have done, it is in the Wise Institute. They are here making a lung on chip. So here you have a membrane. In one side, you have epithelial cells, lung cells, and that is the air channel. There you have air. So it is an air liquid interface. Other side, you have media flow, which is mimicking blood. And there you have your endothelial cells. So you are mimicking the structural aspect of alveoli in your lung. As I said, you need to mimic at least one structural as aspect. That is you are mimicking Basal membrane, epithelial cells one side, endothelial cells other side. Now you, you, you would like to mimic one function and we know that in the in lung that, that constantly expand and uh, shrink. So for that they have these two channels in this side which is a vacuum channel. So once they create vacuum in a sinusoidal manner that causes this membrane to expand and shrink, expand and shrink. And that kind of mimics the, uh, the uh, again, the working of lung. And then what they have checked is that if you have some bacteria here in your ER channel that infect the cells, epithelial cells here, mimicking lung infection. And then you have the um, uh, white blood cells here, which can sense that, okay, these cells got infected. So from day, come from this blood, blood site, passing through the membrane, coming to the air site, and then killing the bacteria at the air interface. So it is mimicking the function, that the, that the, that the immunological function that happens in the lung. So this is how all the uh, uh, organ on chip devices are made. They, they, they may not, they may not, I mean, they may have very different design, but the whole purpose is mimicking one function, at least one function, at least one structural feature. So we have many different types of organ on chip models, and some of them are mimicking tissue barrier functions, some of them are mimicking flow, some of them are mimicking stretching, and sometimes you can see that say lung will go tissue barrier function as well as the stretching or pulsation that has lungs, guts, heart. And then you also mimic migration and invasion in case of tumors. So all these various things people have made, and I am sure many of you have attended many talks. They have discussed all these various different topics. So now what if we want to utilize it finally for say in a pharma industry and the drug screening, what we want to, what I am asking or what we ask is that, can I mimic the response of a human body to a drug and chemical, as I said? Question here is that, what are you trying to mimic? Because if I try to mimic everything, meaning is that I'm recreating the organ or almost making an artificial organ, then it also becomes too complicated and it might not be then useful to see the, you know, to understand the mechanism, right? So you want a simple structure 
but at the same time you want to mimic something so first and the foremost thing you have to have a very clear idea what we are trying to mimic in our particular organ on chip model okay so once you have that idea that what you are trying to mimic next our question comes and that is the problem how do i scale so what i'm say trying to mimic the lung on chip or, or, or the, sorry lung but then what i am making in a microfluidic device probably the various length scale time scales etc are different from what is happening in the lung and in my device right so the question comes how do i scale pardon me i will just drink a little bit of this thing because i have a little sore throat today <clears throat> thank you so when i think of that how do i scale you may think that okay just you know the way these pictures are scaled you increase the all the aspect you know in the all the dimension and you expand it or you shrink it in all the di dimensions equally and you are good but that might not be the case i will explain and obviously the burning question in the field is that how do i validate my system so i will talk about how do i scale a little bit then i will come to the problem of the validation and then again i will go back to the how do i scale and i will talk about how various engineering questions that are important here and some of those questions actually are already answered in the field of engineering particularly in the field of chemical engineering and can we borrow from there so to go ahead first i talk about the problem of scaling so i take a very simple example here say i take two cylinders one cylinder is height h now i am it's, i am scaling it up so if i increase both diamond both the dimensions radius and height equally i get 2r here and 2h here what happens in this process is that my volume of this larger one is eight times of the volumes of my smaller one but the if i look at a cross sectional area that is four times so the volume increases by eight times cross sectional area increases only by four times similarly the available surface area that cylindrical surface that i have that also increases by four times so essentially as the size goes up your area by volume ratio goes down and vice versa what kind of problem this gives rise to first of all you think of that the stress right stress i know that weight per unit area and weight is that volume multiplied by density so if today you just blow up me like you know just you can imagine you know various different movies like hulk you just increase the size enormously by 10 times volume increase 10 times density remains constant density increases by 10 times but then your area does not increase in that way so if you blow me up the stress on my leg that will get doubled if you just double me in my volume the stress on my leg will get doubled and my bones are not ready to you know uh, take that kind of stress so i will actually collapse so all the imagination of blowing blowing up or shrinking down is not actually scientific that way so this is the problem of blowing up there is a problem of shrinking down too i will just come to that another problem is that when we look at the mass transfer all the or the heat transfer can you just give me a second sorry about that Yeah, yeah, I am yeah, extremely sorry about that. That phone was ringing. Yeah, so if we look at the mass transfer rate or heat transfer or any kind of the transfer that we are talking about, that depends on the available surface area. 
So once I reduce the size, my volume is going down, but my surface area is not going down similarly. Volume goes down, say, by eight times, surface area only goes down by four times. So my available surface is now more. So as I decrease the size, the transfer rate, which depends on the available surface area, goes up. So the sorry, yeah. So the so if you look at say in this kind of thing that when I increase the size by five, my volume increases by you know 125 times, but my you know the total surface area is now 150 and my available surface to volume ratio is 1.2. So how I can kind of have the same surface area at this small and this one, just simply break your bigger structure into smaller units. And that is, you know, that is why our body is made up of those small, small cells. And that is why also the cell size has a limit. If you go bigger than that, the whatever uh, nutrients needed inside the cell, the surface area is not sufficient for that, that, at that rate, the nutrients to come in as well as excreted material to go out. That's why our cells has a definite size that cannot go beyond that. Also, if you think of the smaller animals, their body volume is small, uh, small but volume to surface area ratio is high. So they lose heat much faster than what we do and to maintain that heat they need to actually generate a lot of heat so that they need to have a high metabolism and that's why they need to eat a lot so you will see that the smaller animals they eat a lot they eat eat continuously so this is a natural thing and so when we design our system we need to keep this in mind that if i change the dimensions all my transport that is happening, everything changes. So I need to keep in mind that what uh, changes I am doing and that should match what is happening in your body. The problem is not just the case of transport processes. You can also think of the scaling issues in flow. As I said, most of our organ on chief devices has the perfusion or the microfluidic flow. If I think of a flow, you know, a channel, which is perfectly circular in their cross section from our uh, basic fluid dynamics uh, uh, equations, I can get that this is my mass flow rate. This is my wall shear stress. That is because of the fluid flow. The fluid applies frictional stress on the wall that is called wall shear stress and this is the velocity and this is how they scale now if i reduce say my uh, radius of my channel by half what happens is that my velocity goes get reduced by four times okay also now you think of that you have designed a, a micro channel to mimic the vasculature so at this in inner side of that channel, you have endothelial cells. So when you reduce the radius by half, the surface area available also gets reduced by half. So your cell number sitting here goes reduced by half, but your mass flow rate gets reduced by 1 16th. So now your nutrition that was coming got reduced by 116 times, but number of cells have gone reduced only by half. So now you need to increase the mass flow rate. How to increase the mass flow rate? If I now look at, say that I may need to increase the, this pressure drop, pressure applied to flow, I need to increase that pressure drop. So I may, I may need to then increase that by 16 times to maintain that same mass flow rate. First of all, in a microfluidic device, if you want to increase the pressure by 16 times, you may get leakage. But suppose you can do that. 
but then that increases the wall shear by eight times and velocity by four times. Now the cells that you have here, if they are sensitive to the shear stress, you now want to increase the mass flow rate to have the nutrient supply per cell same, but then your wall shear stress per cells changes, right? So that's why you need to be very clear that what do you want to match for my cell types that I'm looking at, are they very sensitive towards the shear stress? Or I can actually can kind of ignore the shear stress increase and I can maintain my nutrient flow. So those things we need to think of while scaling my device. Okay, so why this, this scaling is important? Because I will just, because for the validation, as I said, from the scaling, if I now go to the validation, these are the six different criteria that has been given for a uh, organ on chip device validation by OECD. And that says that first one, you have a very clear cut test method definition that what you are testing and how you are testing. Then you should have within lab reproducibility, that is obvious. Then you should have transferability from one place to the other, one lab to the other, it should get transferred between lab uh, reproducibility. But this is the, I, I mean, in, in our today's discussion context, this is very important that it must have the predictive capacity, right? That is the whole purpose of designing your organ on chip. You want your chip to have a predictive ability. You want to use this device to predict the adverse outcome, if any. So how you can decide about the predictive ability and how you can actually ensure that yes, my device can predict the outcome. And for that, you have to validate your, say if I give the example, go with the example of lung on chip, you have to validate your device with some drugs that known to cause an adverse outcome. So it is known to cause an adverse outcome in our, you know, that lung on chip device. So they used IL-2, interleukin-2 in their blood flow. And that causes, it is known to causes edema, liquid transfer from blood to the air site, lung site. And that actually happened. So you need to validate with some drugs known to cause an adverse outcome. You also need to validate with some drugs that known to, sorry, it, I have made a mistake, that called known to cause no adverse outcome. And you have to validate in both the ways. And then you can call that, okay, now my device is validated. However, the problem is that you have validated your device for one particular drug. Now, if I change the drug or the molecules, I am changing the size of the molecule. I am changing, I may change the electric charge over them. They together may cause a change in the diffusivity of that molecules. Also, if I change the geometric parameters, that is, you may have designed a, a lung on chip with width 100 micron and you have validated it. Do I really need to stick to 100 micron when I reproduce the design? Or can I go to 200 micron? Or can I go to 50 micron? What is my window of, you know, where I can play? The fluid velocity. You have may used some X microliter per minute. Do I need to stick to that? How critical is that? And so every time if I change a molecules, if I need to validate it again, against an animal model, then the purpose is lost, right? So once established for one molecule, I need to have some kind of confidence and some kind of mechanism to, to say that if it if this transfer process, I'm talking in terms of lung on chip, so that's why I'm talking about transfer process. If this transfer process worked for these molecules, it should work for that molecule also with this, this variation in properties. And it will also work for these, these changes in geometrical parameters as well as my process parameters, such as pressure and velocity. So I need to have a theoretical background or confidence to predict that. 
Now I will again go back in the scaling process and I will tell that why that prediction is problematic. So I will, as I said, I will take the example of this lung on chip. So it is easier, and, but it is not limited to lung on chip. You can just transfer this thought process into any other or, you know, organ on chip device. So as we know, what is happening in the lung, there is this uh, alveoli, bronchiole alveoli, and then there are your endothelial cells capillary and oxygen and carbon dioxide transfers are happening through this alveolar membrane. From air side, oxygen is going to the blood. There is the surface of the lung and then carbon dioxide coming from blood to the air. That is, we all know that. So essentially, if I look at this, what is happening at that interface, if I look at that interface carefully, I will see that I have this basal, this, this, this lamina, the basal membrane. Then one side, I have my uh, lung cells and there are different types of lung cells, but for our uh, you know, ease, I just think of cells, let us think of just one cell type. Now that is another question that if I have multiple cell types at what stoichiometric ratio I should use those cell types, those questions are there, but those questions are more in the field of biologist. I'm not going there for today's talk, but let us just think of, we have one cell types there, then I have a membrane and then I have the endothelial cells in the other side. So this is something that I'm trying to mimic. One side I have, I, I have capillary flow, another side I have air. Yeah, so that is I'm trying to mimic. Now, if I look the mass transfer happening at this region, what is happening there? In the gas phase, I have the partial pressure, say of oxygen, then the concentration very close to the uh, membrane, alveolar membrane, the oxygen concentration goes down. Then a trans, because why it is goes down? Because I need a difference of the concentration so that things can flow, right? To flow, you need a difference. To flow heat, you need a, you need a temperature difference. To flow mass, you need a concentration or partial pressure difference. So there is a partial pressure difference from the bulk phase. I assume it is constant. Then it is going down, coming to the air surface or the epithelial surface of my membrane. That is epithelial surface of my membrane. Then through the epithelial cells and membrane, it is further going down and it is going to the other side in the endothelial side. And then again, there is something called this boundary layer where there is another decrease in gradient. And so that the things can transfer from this point to this point. So this is your liquid phase uh, uh, blood side. So essentially what the direction is for the carbon dioxide transfer, you can think of. If you think of the oxygen transfer, it will be exactly the other way. And this thing will be the opposite high here, going down in the boundary layer, further going down in your membrane, further going down this, this boundary layer and coming here. So if I look at that, the, what is my resistance offered by this whole thing, it is like your electrical resistance that you have, that the total resistance to transfer is gas side resistance that is here. Then the membrane resistance, which is consisted of epithelial cells, semi-permeable membrane and endothelial cells, and then the liquid side resistance. So if you want to predict something, you actually need to have an idea that how much these resistance are and how this resistance changes when I changes various parameters associated with it. Now, the funny part is that as we know, if I change the velocity in the gas side or the liquid side, the boundary layer thickness reduces and the resistance goes down. So that's how everything is kind of connected and you need to understand those connections. I can make the problem even further complicated, one step more. And now I can say that my epithelial cells are not just simply sitting on my uh, membrane, 
or my endothelial cells are not simply sitting on my membrane, but I have put them in some 3D, you know, ECM, say matrigel, so that get that exactly, you know, the epithelial, uh, epithelial endothelial, that barrier structure. I put my endothelial cells on some kind of ECM. And now ECM porosity comes into picture. How your uh, resistance will be, that depends on how much porous your this uh, ECMs are, where you have put them. And this is very important to understand because you may, you may want to actually model some disease condition. And if you want to model some various disease condition in, in lung or for, for that matter, for any other uh, organ, we know that the ECM porosity, ECM stiffness, ECM cross-linking all changes. And as the porosity changes, your transport also changes. So if I want to mimic, say, a COPD lung, I actually need to mimic that kind of uh, ECM behavior. Otherwise, my organ on chip may work fine and fantastic for a healthy lung, but may not predict what will happen in case of a COPD lung or a, a, a asthma lung. Okay. Further to complicate the process, I'm sorry to kind of, but further to complicate the process, now you think of that in this extracellular porous matrix, now you have cells which are sitting there and they are also consuming oxygen. So when your oxygen is getting transported from here to here, they are not just being able to passively go from this point to this point, but that oxygen is getting consumed by the cells which are in that ECM, they are lying in the ECM. So it is a very uh, uh, classic example where your diffusion and reaction happening at the same time simultaneously. And as I said, that there are situation in engineering already and people have modeled that fantastically. So th this is one example that is we use for the porous catalyst. So what is that? If you are not aware of, so the for various industrial applications, we use solid catalyst and they are like a sphere, a ball but that is porous, so it has lots of pores in between. And say a gaseous reaction is happening, so A and B, two gas, they diffuse through the pores, they go to the uh, inside pore, the surface of your solid surface of your catalyst, there they react, there they become C, A plus B gives rise to C, and C then comes out. So now your, react, your reaction rate, depends on how easily A and B can go inside and how can they react on the surface and where they get consumed. So those designs are already there and we can actually borrow from there to model or to do our calculation for our pura structure, even for the tissue engineering scaffold design that how much nutrients will diffuse into the scaffold and how much will get consumed. And such modeling can further give you insight if you want to say create a tumor and where you know there will be a necrotic core because your nutrients will not reach to the necrotic core. So you can do all those modelings and that will tell you the, you know, the calculation that how to design your system. I go one step further and I add further complex uh, complexities. So as I as I told you already that this boundary layer thickness and the resistance depends on flow velocity. Now in my, uh, some diseases, the flow velocity may change. And although when we design an organ on chip, it is just simple, uh, you know, nice cylindrical or a, 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 a rectangular channel. But in reality, our flow that is happening inside our bodies, the tubes walls are not rigid. They are always flexible. They can actually get, you know, expanded. 
and that may change a lot of flow property which happens in case of a simple rigid wall, rigid wall flow and again the good thing is that this has been modeled by engineer for last 30 40 years then you can have say the in the disease of atherosclerosis you may have plaque formation and which may constrict your channel and some location again your flow structure may change a lot and not may it will change a lot and finally in many of you our tubings in our body we have small cilia on the tube walls and they actually move at the wall so as a result in a regular engineering understanding we say a no slip condition boundary that is at the boundary fluids are not moving they are stuck to the wall that may not be true when we are thinking of a ciliary design or if i want to mimic a ciliary tube so these are the various complications that are there in vivo you may want to mimic that say if you are mimicking a ciliopathy uh, you know, in your organ on cheek, then you really need to consider the role of the cilia. You cannot ignore that. And then you need to really think of what the, this difference of cilia will actually, you know, going to change my flow profile. So all these things are connected. And as I said, lot of the theoretical understanding has already gone into the fluid mechanics field. So what the engineers does, I don't know how to minimize this one but anyway forget it so what the engineers do in such kind of situations what we go for we go for dimensionless understanding <coughs> sorry what is the dimensionless understanding say you may may know the reynolds number which predicts whether my flow will be laminar layer by layer or turbulent chaotic i can i i can uh, uh, absolutely describe my flow profile if i know my reynolds number and this reynolds number is a combination of diameter density of the fluid velocity of the fluid and viscosity of the fluid these four parameters now i may have done my design for this size of a circular pipe with this velocity but if i need to change that for a much larger diameter or maybe a square or a rectangular channel a different geometry different size different shape different size but if i play around my velocity density viscosity so that my reynolds number are same for all these three situations my flow profile will be same in all these three situations and that is how actually we design say if i if i want to design a large uh, uh, you know airbus uh, uh, aeroplane but i will model that in a small wind channel wind tunnel in my lab that is much sw uh, smaller in size but we uh, vary the parameters so that we can match this kind of numbers such as Reynolds number in case of aeroplane we also need to match the Mach number but in case of the context that we are talking about I need to match my Reynolds number and if my Reynolds number match so my diameter might be different my shape might be different density of my fluid might be different I might be using water but then the what I want to mimic is a blood which has increased this thickness I mean viscosity but if I can match my Reynolds number, my prediction will hold good. So even if I change my system, my prediction will be still valid. Uh, so that's why the engineers have this whole lot of, I mean, I, I have just listed a few, a few here, but we have a whole lot of different uh, dimensionless numbers and you know, heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid flow. You need to understand that what is applicable in your system and you can pick that that you know which is applicable and then you can utilize in your system for example if i look at the thile modulus as i was talking about in a porous catalyst so nutrient uptake rate by nutrient diffusion rate 
So if I design two different, uh, uh, say tumors of different porosity, different cell density, different cell types. But if I know that I am matching my this to rate or, or this ratio, then I know that my diffusion reaction has been taken care of. So this is how to use the dimensionless number and that we need to bring into our organon chip device. I will just give one example to kind of explain further the beauty of these dimensionless numbers. So again, I'm taking the example of lung. So in case of your lung, we have two types of transport. One is called convective transport. That is in your larger, these uh, 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 tubings, you have this air flow going on. So the material, say for example, oxygen is being carried from this position to this position simply because of the flow. So that is your convective flow. And then when you have the membrane, say in your alveoli, there things are going from one side, say the air side to the liquid side, and that is through the diffusion. So that is the mass transfer due to diffusion. Right. So there we have one interesting dimensionless number that is called Peclé number. And that is defined by L, the length scale of your system. So length scale here will be very different from the length scale here. This will be much smaller. Multiplied by velocity of air. Again, as I am going in, going more and more inside, that is, it is a fractal design. I'm going generation one to two from one, it is divided into two. So this is generation zero, uh, generation one, generation two, and so on and so forth. As I increase my generation, my cross-sectional area goes down for each channel, but more or less the pressure drop remains same. So as a result, flow velocity goes down. So L goes down, U goes down, but my diffusivity, molecular diffusivity from air to the liquid, air to the uh, molecular diffusion of oxygen from air to blood, that remains kind of the same. So if my L and U are going down, so my Peclé number is going down as I go from this position to this position to this position to further and further down. And as you see, your Peclé number is mass transfer due to convection, simple carrying mass transfer due to diffusion. So here I have my Peclé number more than one, but as I go inner and inner generation to higher generation, my Peclé number goes down and about after 15 to 16 uh, generation, Peclé number goes from below one. So it crosses one. So after, uh, before that it is more than one. So mass transfer is mostly happening because of the convection, fluid is flowing, air is flowing in your duct. But after the 15th generation here, Peclé number goes below one. So now mass transfer is happening because of the diffusion, because now your velocity has go, you know, gone down too much. So things are not moving much. The L is small, so your total structure is very small. So now diffusion can take over. And if we look at the structure of the lung, that is so beautiful that the alveoli or alveoli structure starts to come up only after that 15, 16 generation. Because if they were there before that, those are useless because that time the transport is happening through the convection. You don't have enough time for the transport. So that is the beauty of the natural design, how it, it has evolved, that where the Peclé number goes below one, there the diffusion takes over convection and there your alveolar starts to come. So now you can explain how your structure of lung is such that using some very well established engineering principle. So other than that, other engineering aspects are as I already described, porosity, how your proteins and other molecules are getting absorbed or adsorbed on the surface of your material that you are making. So most of the time we make with the PDMS and PDMS adsorbs hydrophobic material. So that's a problem using PDMS. 
there is the problem of i mean that we need to also need to consider the mechanical properties stiffness because we know now and my lab works a lot into that how the stiffness of the material controls cellular behavior so if i want to mimic something i need to keep in mind what is the stiffness of that organ that i want to mimic and then comes the cell adhesion and the ligand density that i have marked as green because that is more to the domain of the chemist and biologist but this part are the more towards the domain of the engineers although now there is no difference if, i mean everyone is mixed uh, so i thought to give a one example of the mechanical properties how that is important in the in the context but i am skipping that part interest of time so but as i just to kind of tell you that uh, because as you are changing the the structure of your scaffold it is changing not only the porosity it is changing also the mechanical properties so all those things you have to design your materials in such a way that it can mimic all those important properties uh, so this part i will completely skip so this is something that we are working on the glioblastoma and we have shown that how it is so so this is what we are doing with uh, dr shilpi that's from actric her student anadha and my student with kian pallavi and we are looking at how the substantiveness influence the you know the behavior of glioblastoma cells uh, i i'll skip the whole part but i will just only show you one thing here that how my cells respond to the drug temozolamide that strongly depends on on what substrate i am culturing them am i culturing them on plastic or am i culturing them on something that mimics brain stiffness so there are two issues here one thing is that i may from my if i don't consider this aspect then i may pass a drug in my initial screening hoping that it will work but once the it will it has to work in a soft environment like brain it will fail because it will not be able to kill the uh, the uh, tumor cells on the other hand the other possibility as i told at the beginning i may discard some molecules looking at here that oh they will not work but actually probably they were very useful molecules so that is the importance of you know incorporating all those various micro physiological aspects into our design and so that we can predict things better so i will just can skip that part so I, i i have come to the last part of my talk and here we are talking about the challenges and overviews in this particular field and as you all know that now people are also thinking of making something like human on chip where we can put all those different organ on chip together and say for example i put some aerosol drug in my lung on chip and finally i would like to see how much that reaches in my bone or or heart or i i put something an oral drug in my gut on chip and i would like to see how much that goes to my liver and from there it further goes to the other organs so as i already mentioned you need to think of material requirements if i need to uh, connect all those things i need to think of multiplexing downstream sensing culturing relevant cell types and their stoichiometry different cells different media uh, need uh, different media condition so all those things something that biologist need to think and they are thinking and then there is this important part that is what surat was saying at the very beginning that this regulation validation and also we need a training and you know we need to have this psychological barrier to cross to adapt this uh, this this new technology emerging technology but again to cross that psychological barrier if i am a organ on chip designer it is my responsibility to validate and convince a traditional biologist or a pharmacist to tell him or her that see you can use my device and it can predict well enough for your drug so it is my job to convince that person and to achieve that job i need to 
design my things which are easier to validate and which is applicable for a universal range of drugs and systems. So this is something that the field is going on and we are somewhere here. So this is the traditional model, 3D culture model and the animal model. And this is how this organon chief model is kind of coming up. And if you look at that, what is the next generation model demands that we need to bring in vivo like complexities more. We need to bring functionalities that is vascularization, immune response, et cetera. But important part is that it should be fully validated. Replacement for animal testing but at the same time, it has to be cost effective and user friendly. So if I make it too complex, probably it will not be useful. So I need to understand that how much complexity is absolutely needed to mimic my, the function that I'm targeting and to understand how much functionality is absolutely needed. I need to evaluate the, what is the effect of various different uh, 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 procedure that is going on, flow, mass transfer, heat transfer, etc. In the mass transfer, heat transfer, convection, diffusion, etc. And they are my knowledge of, of engineering, particularly chemical engineering, which will be very useful. And it is surprisingly well developed. So we just need to kind of copy from that to here. But at the same time, we need the help of the biologists to get that tissue relevant parameters. Again, those are already there, but we need more to reach tissue relevant parameters to get from them. What is the viscosity? What is the diffusivity? What is the porosity in the actual tissues? Then I need to bring those two parameters together, do my back of the envelope calculation. I need to match my dimensionless numbers, and then I need to design my organ on chip device. So, this way, engineers should help in validation, improving predictive power, and making the device easy to use and robust. And biologists should help in, again, in the validation, but then, uh, sorry, I, I just messed up the last slide, but they should help us in giving us the important parameters that is uh, required to do our calculations. So with this, I thank you all, and uh, thank you again, for your patience, giving me chance to talk to you and uh, I'm ready to take any further questions. Thank you, Dr. Abhiji for the wonderful talk. So we have a few questions, so uh, we'll, I'll just read them out now. So if anyone else has any question, please, uh, you can type it in the chat box uh, below. So uh, the first question is from Shreyos, uh, she or she. So she's asking, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, sir. About the lung on chip model, do you consider the lung surfactant and its function from an engineering perspective, since there is a lot of rheology to work on? Absolutely. So, yeah, so that is a, a fantastic question. I have kind of excluded that in, in interest of time. But yes, I mean, surfactant is another layer, right? And that is, again, adding the resistance to your transfer right also it causes it helps things not to collapse together that is the biological function but that adds to the resistance and if you if in your lung on chip model if you are interested to understand the transport say you are interested to understand what is the uh, transport of a nanoparticle or a particular drug you need to bring into that consideration how that drug is going to react the, the surfactant that is present on the lung surface and how the, that the transport of that particular drug is going to get impaired because of the presence of that surfactant. So yes, absolutely, depending on your question, you may need to bring that aspect into your design. Uh, so another question is from Sukanya who is asking, can we use uh, organ on chip to study interaction of tumor spheroid with other type of cells? Tumor spheroids with others. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So the I mean I mean I have not talked about that, but there are a lot of the uh, work is going on, and in my lab also, uh, Ketki is working on that to work on the tumor on chip. So again, <clears throat> oh, there's a Ketki in his lab. Sorry. Sorry, no, I think someone was uh, unmuted. Yeah. 
Okay. So yeah. So the Ketki in in my lab at the present, she is working on the glioblastoma tumor, right? So what we are working on that you create the tumor, then or so again, how to create the tumor? There is again another set of work. That is going on, but then you can put the tumor in the device. So, if as we are working on the glioblastoma, so I would like to put the tumor in an environment that mimic the brain stiffness. Then, if I want to mimic that, what how my drug is going to interfere with my tumor, I may also need to design blood brain barrier, and this transport process and the flow process will come again into picture. And then you can have this tumor one side, blood brain barrier, your blood flow, where you add your drug. So yes, you can definitely design that. A lot of the people are already working on that and, and many literatures are already available. So if you are interested, you can do some Google search and can read further. So another person is asking, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Organ on chip delineates a particular problem statement in a pathological condition and studies the same in the developed system. However, pathological condition are multifaceted or interlinked. Can this complexity be added to organ on chip? Yeah, so uh, exactly. So <clears throat> as one example that I was giving, let's say when I'm designing the lung on chip, right? Now, if I put a simple membrane, epithelial cell, endothelial cells, I am looking at transport. Okay, fine. Probably that is good enough. But if I am trying to mimic COPD or lung cancer or, or asthma, there I already know that the structure got modified in my um, um, ECM. And if I don't bring that ECM complexity into the picture, my model will not be able to predict. As someone was asking about the surfactant, if I know that the surfactant has, has gone bad and I'm trying to mimic a, a disease condition where the surfactant has gone bad, then I need to bring that complexity into my picture. Otherwise it is useless, right? So, so, that, so, so like that's why in, the, my, in one of my very initial slide, I said that first of all, you need to have a very clear idea that what you are trying to mimic. Your one device cannot mimic every aspect. If you try to mimic every aspect, it will be too complex. It will be not user friendly, not cost effective. So you need to first very clear in your mind what I am trying to mimic. Am I trying to mimic a healthy lung and trying to look at toxicological transfer from the uh, air pollutant? Or I am trying to mimic a COPD lung and I would like to see what's the effect of smoking on that COPD lung then you need to design and you need to bring the complexity. If today say I, say I want to mimic the complexity, say for the uh, COVID affected lung, I need to bring that the, you know, the cell death, uh, the, the formation of fibrosis into the picture, maybe the immune reaction into the picture if I want to mimic that immune development phase, immune storm, cyt cytokine storm, then I need to bring my immunity into the system. So yes, we can mimic the pathological system and that is essentially the goal. But to do that, we need to be very clear what we want to mimic, what are the key features of that pathological condition. And then we need to think of how I can bring that key feature into my organ on chip device in the easiest way, in the simplest way. Yeah. Uh... So next question is, I think you kind of touched upon it, but uh, the person is asking, what are the challenges to the organ on chip applications? Um, uh -huh. So I think I have touched upon at the end that the, the various different challenges, probably the question came, but the, uh, if you ask me, I mean, if you ask just my very personal opinion, I would say that there are three major challenges kind of. One is the vascularization and having the vasculature structure bring the immunity, immune reaction into picture. And third, that was kind of the major discussion is the validation. How do I validate a, a device? I can design a device and the, every week new, new designs for the various different organ on chips are coming into picture. How do I validate that? And as I said, if I need to validate a device for every drug 
I am going to test using an animal model, then the purpose is lost, right? I mean, then I will rather go for animal model itself. Why I will use that? So, so I think that is a major challenge. And I think in that aspect, aspect, everyone working in this field need to work together that what do I need to match to so that I can say, okay, my device is validated for this range of molecular weight of the drug or this range of diffusible or these properties of the drug. What is the calculation? So today, if I, if I need to validate, say, any other established technology, right? There are very steps are already given. You do this, you do this, you do this calculation. You show that the safety is more than such and such, such percentage. Your drug, your technology is validated. Even if I want to design a new car or a new drug, there is a very well established criteria. In organanship, those criteria are still evolving. And I think that is a major challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So next question is from uh, Vartik, uh, who's asking, uh, thank you for the insightful lecture, Dr. Majumdar. What are the manufacturing constraints that one has to work with when it comes to designing these tips? That is, uh, how micro can we go when it comes to depth of these channels, speaking in practical terms? Yes, so that is also another very important question. So uh, in the so one aspect that I was talking, so the, I, I, I would take this question from three angles. One is that just to make your device and we can now even make the nanoscale channels that that technology is there. If we need, we can make the nanoscale channel. Problem is that that technology is not available to everyone, to every institute, right? Even here in you know, IIT Bombay, which is, is kind of, we have a lot of infrastructure compared to many other places, but still we face challenges in getting things designed and fabricated, right? So those are the fabrication challenges. Uh, technologically, we can do that and we can actually make very complex designs thanks to our, you know, the, the micro technology, micro fabrication in, in, in uh, micro electronics. So those fabrication are already there, but not available to all of us. But the question is that again, I will go back to the where I'm, I mean, I mean, I know I'm repeating myself, but do I really need to go to the nanoscale to answer that question? Or can I design it in a micro scale, but match those dimensionless numbers so that whatever I predict in my micro, uh, micro scale should be applicable in the nanoscale also. But I need to also keep in mind when I go from the micro scale to nanoscale, some physical uh, characteristic of the molecules may get changed. Some interactions may get changed that I need to be, be, be careful. That is one aspect. Second aspect is that, uh, sorry, uh, so the, uh, we can again, speaking, speaking in terms of the practical terms, right? So the second aspect is that, sorry, I thought three things, but I forgot. <laughs> Uh, uh, you want me to repeat the question? No, so that I can read the questions under yeah, yeah. because of designing these chips. Yeah, one is this one. Second is that do I really need to mimic that? And third, I was thinking something, but which I forgot. Sorry, if it, if, if it comes, I will keep. Sure, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the next question is from Samya, who's saying, thank you for the great talk. The field is very exciting. Can you share the timeline to develop uh, the organ on chip? also tried uh, brain and chip for neuro disorders. So Samia, by timeline, do you mean the timeline of the technology or timeline in your lab if you want to make it? So if you can unmute yourself or- Yeah, just... in the lab, in the lab. Maybe the after lab. we get the chip, how do we go ahead the timeline? Okay. So see, I mean, uh, this is not a very easy question to answer. Uh, if so, I mean, from my own personal experience, I can tell you that some of the chip, they actually worked very well and there were not much trouble. In some other designs, we really had to kind of, you know, break our head to optimize the device because there were the leakage issue, cells are not surviving, um, cells are not growing, then uh, sterility is one of the very important issue. So, uh, 
there is no straightforward answer to this. Uh, but if you are bringing the chip from somewhere else, and if it has already designed and standardized that, okay, there is no leakage and the, all the connections, etc., are going fine. Uh, then, I mean, if your cells survive and if your uh, media, I mean, I mean, again, two cells may not survive in one particular media. So you need to also uh, optimize the media uh, for two cell types to survive. Uh, but if that works fine, you can start, you know, as, as soon as you get your device. But if they don't, you may need to optimize so it. The, the chip is like a multi-layer. No, you have multi-layer cells, like you have different mm -hmm. layers of cells. So mm -hmm. you you just uh, uh, you just culture each layer. You have a different uh, what you call chambers for all these, and you culture the specific layer or specific cell type in the chambers, and the, finally they function as argon. That's how it goes, right? Right. Yeah. But then, as I'm saying, that when you are having a multi-layer structure. Right. And say so you have flow from one side, flow from other side, and then, but then the things so that whatever media I'm flowing here, whatever media I'm flowing here, they mm -hmm. are different media, but then there is the exchange happening. Now the cell type that I have here, they may not like the other media and they may start actually dying. Many of the times the, uh, you know, the, um, cells the cell types that you want to use they may not want to stick to your membrane they uh, so if those kind of situations you face then you have to optimize you need to look off you know look for what coating i need to give so that my cells can stick they survive they live happily and so that optimization process may take some time and how long i actually i don't know even how to predict that, that how long it will take. Sometimes even just within a week, you are ready to go. Sometimes it takes a few months to. So Things for example, I work on brain disorder. Hmm. So if I have to mimic some brain disorder and I have to see the synapse between two types of neurons or an interaction between glion neurons. Yeah. So then I can uh, mimic the uh, that portion of the brain region uh, at the particular region of the brain by including these two cells, given yes. extracellular membrane, all those things. And we'll see how this disease mm. is happening, like the pathology or what are mechanisms of this disease in the particular cell type or a brain region when these two cells are interacting. So, so this is what we are trying to understand. So I'm trying to understand the principle and application of this. Uh, so, I mean, so, this is... Uh, did yeah. I say it correctly or uh, is there any way... No, no, so, the, so, the, so the, I think you are going exactly in the right direction and, and you know, this is very exciting field as well. Yeah. Uh, so, but, I mean, I mean, as I said that uh, it, your device, when you put your cells, everything, they, they may start working absolutely fine in the very first go. But then... Uh, but if they say that, for example, you are looking for some kind of synaptic uh, connection, say, suppose, mm -hmm. and yes. you may see that the ECM that you have provided in that ECM, your cells are not being able to make that synaptic connection. And probably then you need to change your ECM so that now your cells can digest or the, the pore size is enough to form that connection. Right. So. Uh, or say, for example, I'm just talking about, say, I have two, uh, two chambers where I have two cell types. They are connected by, by a narrow channel. And I would like to see how these extensions are meeting at the center, suppose. Now I may need to work on the length of that connecting channel so that I can actually finally have that kind of connection form within the given time frame that makes sense in, you know, that in the relevant time, uh, time scale, they can make the connections. So those things you may need to uh, optimize for your own system. So if you wish, you can drop me an email and we can have further discussion on that. I mean, what I'm trying yeah. to say is that it is not a very generalized answer I can give it. It is a very specific problem and it may have some very specific yeah. answers. Yeah. Yes, yes, because yeah, I work on brain disorder and yeah, this looked very exciting and since uh, the disorder that I work on, it's in the process of developing that. So something like this, we have a good, I mean, we can try out. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
सूरत यू आर म्यूटेड सॉरी सॉरी आई रियलाइज ओके सो सो जस्ट टेक आई थिंक टू मोर क्वेश्चंस फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज फ्रॉम विकास आस्किंग टू क्वेश्चंस सो फर्स्ट पार्ट इज अगेन आई थिंक यू हैव काइंड ऑफ आंसर्ड ही इज आस्किंग हाउ फीजिबल इज दिस टेक्नोलॉजी फॉर मोर कॉम्प्लेक्स ऑर्गन्स लाइक लिवर uh and second is how feasible is it to incorporate organoid in this system so i guess first part i you kind of touched upon it when when in terms of complexity you have to pick and choose what aspects of complexity you want to model uh so uh so i'm not sure if you want to shed more light on it so the second aspect is how feasible is it to incorporate organoid in the system so people are now doing that to put the organoid so the so the uh, from the organ on chip we are talking about organoid on chip we are also trying to do the 3d printed organ structure and then putting that in a perfusion system so 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 like people are doing that i mean even in our lab i mean not in our lab in a joint collaborative lab with uh, dr deepak modi from in irrh we are trying to make the organoid on chip system yes, so so it is very feasible and the last question is from ravi and they are asking excellent talk uh, dr abhijit your comments on the thermal control in this direction so ravi uh, so I, actually i i know him he was my uh, junior in my lab in iit kanpur uh, and he is also doing fantastic work now okay. yes <laughs> so ravi so the you know uh, thermal control if the thermal control is important say so the in the in your application you are looking at you right. you you may need to incorporate that and so like there is no other way right so right. Uh, so you may need to incorporate that uh, but in most i mean in many of the situations in the body because it works in a very narrow range of temperature we can just ignore that and we can have our media at 37 degree and you know we can good enough to go right 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 okay thanks thanks <laughs> this one last nice question. to see you ravi <laughs> yes so we'll just take one last question uh and uh sudeep uh, they are asking we are starting to make lab on chip system to measure the impedance of different types of breast cancer what are the steps to take care what are the steps to take care okay um i need to think of it right i mean uh, i mean some of the things to take care that i have already mentioned right so when you are talking about the breast cancer the the um, uh, ecm gets modified so you need to bring that ecm into picture ecm stiffness ecm porosity that's a very important and when you are talking about the impedance obviously you need to bring those those uh, ecm properties because that gets hugely modified in case of the breast cancer system right that you are definitely need to bring into picture uh cell types because uh, uh cancer i mean the cancer is a as we all know that i mean that is a very complex kind of the micro environment yes. that gets hugely modified right uh yes. you have various different cell types cafs that comes into picture uh your obviously your cancer cells your immune cells so um i mean all are the various things to consider i can think of off hand uh, whether to consider that or not uh, probably i i need to think more and i think you are the best person to think in that direction actually sir uh, we are just going to start this kind of projects we have never done this kind of projects before so um, if we if if we can send you uh, the mail regarding this matter Uh, actually, I need your help to carry out this project. Initial I'll, help. I will be happy to help. No problem. No problem at all. I'll be very, yeah, very happy to help. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just paste your email ID in sure. the chat box. Yeah. Please, and uh, if I'm sure people are having more questions, so they can uh, contact you on email to. ask any specific queries which they might have in the project i so am actually here. giving my gmail id uh, sure. because i am very bad and what happens is that my uh, iitb address often gets full so things start getting busy <laughs> sure. you can sure, send it sure. sure yeah yeah so yeah so the gravity that's posted is email in the chat box if anyone wants to get more clarity on any of the Particular aspects related to organ on chip, uh, they can write to you. 
so uh, with this i think uh, we'll stop we had uh, i think we had kind of addressed several questions and we're kind of run over time but then it was a very insightful discussion and um, thanks for the great talk dr abhijit and and thanks everyone for joining us on a saturday morning and spending your time so and thanks for the very interactive discussion so thanks everyone and um, so we've also posted the registration link for a uh, for the newsletter which will be coming out next week so please register for the newsletter for more updates on this kind of research both in india and globally so with this I'd like to thank everyone um, yeah and... oh, thank you surat and uh, thank you sham and thank you you know all the audience that still here and ask so many questions so you know that's why i i like this particular platform lots of the discussion happens so yeah thank you very much yeah thanks a lot thanks everyone thank you sir thank you ma'am